if you're watching online, hopefully this is going to go through. Last week, I had everything set up, and the technical malfunction was the idiot who runs the camera, meaning me, forgot to press the button. So it was re-recorded on Thursday, and so it's all there in case you missed something. Uh, but this is hopefully working out the way it ought to. Uh, we're going to uh, <clears throat> look at an interesting subject tonight that keeps pushing us away. But uh, I wanted to ask you this question. How do things become contagious? Now, that's an interesting question now, isn't it? How do you think things become contagious? Easily spreadable. How are they easily spreadable? What's that? Okay. Okay. What makes something contagious? Okay. 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 That that is one of they. There's a social dynamic on that. Uh, you can apply this to a lot of different things. For instance, what what makes one song more popular than another? songs any good, I guarantee you that. Some of them I've heard are any good, but they're, they, they get right to the top. It's an interesting problem. What be, how do things become contagious? And that's going to kind of a, the theme song tonight for our lesson, uh, because I wanted to show you this as well. Several years ago, Facebook had something called the Ice Bucket Challenge. Remember that? Now, Facebook now has been eclipsed by TikTok, and they've gotten progressively worse over the years, but the ice bucket challenge was basically simple. The Muscular Dystrophy Association was raising money. So if you did that and they would, somebody would contribute so much to the uh, muscular dystrophy uh, folks. And uh, so all you had to do was dump cold water on somebody you really didn't like. Doesn't sound like a very hard problem, does it? Are you aware that in one week, one week they raised $100 million in muscular dystrophy? from doing that. To put that in perspective, before that, the biggest charity around was Livestrong. And it raised $50 million, but took it a year. Why did something catch on? That's an interesting concept, and we're going to see something that does that. Uh, because restoration, the match was struck, and it began to um, contagious. It began to move quickly, as we're going to see tonight. There are three factors concerning re restoration. Now, I think we, as we go through the next several weeks, you're going to see these play out more and more. So I think it's good to understand them as we begin. The first factor is that this verse here. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. We know it well, but it says that all Scripture is inspired, God breathed and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The question of restoration is, is the Bible enough, or do you have to have Bible plus something? That's always the struggle, isn't it? Or when it arose, the Bible was kind of second place, to creeds and various other things. But over the years, there's been this, this concept that said, if the Bible's enough, do you need anything else? And the struggle has continued to say that it's the Bible, but we add things to it. Let me give you a modern illustration. I teach enough Bible classes where I hear enough comments that run something like this. It runs one of the two banks. Well, you know, I've got a footnote in my Bible that says, like somehow Paul wrote the footnote. He didn't. Or, here's the other one that's current for us. Well, I read John MacArthur, and he said this verse, Bible plus. Not saying the commentaries were wrong, but Bible plus is always a dangerous proposition when you start saying, well, this can tell us that. That means Bible plus Creed, Bible plus something I read on the internet, Bible plus commentary, Bible plus preacher, whatever it is. The question of restoration is Bible enough by itself. Then, the second is, do you put the church together according to culture, according to scripture? I 
couched it that way so it could be long range. There was a time that uh, the New Testament church was just the New Testament church, but as time went by, culture began to shape it. Its organization changed. Uh, the way its, it's uh, worship changed. The way they thought about various pieces changed. When you get to the Middle Ages and, and the Reformation, the Catholic Church and the various scholars around changed it. When we got to America, the culture changed as we're going to see tonight. And today we still have problems with that because whatever is around us religiously is going to affect us in the church. It's a truism. When, you know, I have enough conversation with people say, we need to be more like, and they'll name another group. Well, is you put it together according to culture or according to scripture, that's going to be a big issue. The third one is, is still a problem for us. Do you emphasize unity over restoration or, uni or restoration over unity? You want to balance those, because that's what we've always said. And in theory, as we're going to see next week, especially with the Campbell. The theory is the way you unify the church is you go back to the pattern of the New Testament and you do the same thing. If you do those things, we will all be unified. The problem is, what happens if there's differences? Do you maintain unity at the cost of restoration? Or do you say, we're restoring the New Testament and we don't care if you go somewhere else? We have suffered that faith as we will see. Those three things you're going to see pop up over and over again as we go through this. So just, just to bring you up to speed, just know where we are. We all began, we all begin in the beginning, the establishment of the church. You've got Peter and Paul and John who are teaching what Jesus taught them to teach. Over time things begin to change and before America came there were groups that got together and said what we see is a departure. Things are not working the way they were. And we looked at a lot of different groups, the Paulicians, the Waldesians, uh, the Unified Brethren, uh, the Sandemanians, the Haldane. And one of the interesting things we saw was they came and they went. They didn't last a long time. It was like a skyrocket. They'd go up and flame out and be gone. But that was also very European. Nothing happened on this side of the Atlantic until last week when we looked at James O. Kelly and a couple guys, Smith and, and Jones, Kelly in Maryland, and Smith and Jones in Vermont, who were coming to the conclusion that maybe if we just read the Bible and follow it, things will be different. And so they began their own independent ways of doing that. Tonight we come to another one. Oh, by the way, their big issue is creeds and organization. You're going to find out, at least in that time, creeds and organization were the big hot issue. Do you have to follow a creed and do you have to listen to a bishop? Bottom line. And that's what drove the ship to them. But tonight we want to look at the hotbed that creates the movement. Three things were happening in America around the turn of the 19th century. First of all, the condition of the church was not the best in the world. Now, for all of the talk that I hear about America began as a Christian nation, that's not actually, actually accurate. You realize that at the turn of the 19th century, between the, the Revolutionary War and the turn of the century, 10% considered themselves Christian. The rest of them considered themselves nothing. And some of that was fostered by the age of reason. Thomas Paine, you remember Thomas Paine? He wrote a little pamphlet called Common Sense, which basically <laughs> lit the fuse of the American Revolution. He thought that Christianity was a silly superstition. It didn't make any sense to reason. Now, I know that busts a lot of bubbles, but that's reality, too. The second thing that was happening, though, was the popularity of the text of Scripture, but to read it as a devotional book. Have you ever read the Bible just as a devotional book? A good book that tells you some good stuff that you kind of need to remember, but you don't worry too much about following all of it. That was kind of the concept of uh, what was taking place as the, as the close of the 1700s came. All of that was probably fueled by the concept of Calvinism. 
If you were predestined before the beginning of the world to be lost, there was nothing you could do about it. If you were predestined to be saved, there was nothing to do, to do about it. Reading your Bible to find out what God wanted you to do didn't make any difference because it couldn't change anything. And going to church wouldn't do any good either, or being Christian wouldn't do any good because that's only for the saved, not for the lost. So it's a waste of time. So you had this, this curious chemistry taking place that something had to happen, and all of that began to change in 1790 when George Whitfield came to America and began what was called the Great Awakening. He preached the first, his first revival at Harvard College in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now, I do have to tell you that there was a time that, came, that Harvard was a seminary to train congregational preachers. I read yesterday, in fact, that they have appointed a new chaplain to the Harvard University Seminary who is an atheist. How you can be a chaplain for a Christian seminary and be an atheist, you got me. That's the strange culture we live in. But it wasn't always the case. He had throngs of people who would listen all day long to him. And what he was basically saying is, that you can respond to the God, God's call. You can be saved. There's this freedom to come to Christ because it has nothing to do with what John Calvin said. It has everything to do with what God is. That was revolutionary. It could be said in America when it couldn't have been said in Europe, probably. One of those who listened to Whitfield is a man named Barton W. Stone. A little bit of background of Stone. He had an interesting background. Stone was a uh, son of a Maryland planter. Uh, and he joined the Revolutionary War late. He was part of George Washington's army in, uh, at Yorktown. If you don't know about American history, Yorktown is where we finally beat the, the British and really gained our independence. He was part of that last battle. He saw the time when that took place. So he had this interesting little background thing, but he wanted to be a preacher. He, wanted, he was a Presbyterian. A little background about Presbyterians. We're going to talk about Presbyterians a lot tonight. Presbyterians were Calvinistic. Presbyterians had to follow the Westminster Creed, uh, 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 Creed of Confession, Westminster Confession, which was began in 1646. Uh, they had a synod system with each synod having a bishop over various areas, and they licensed preachers to preach. And if you were not licensed, you couldn't preach. They also had closed communion, which meant they, they, checked, they checked your vaccination card before you got communion. That's the way I can put it. And that's what closed communion was. So Barton W. Stone wanted to be a preacher, so he goes to a place that is now called Greensboro, North Carolina, to David Wells Academy. David Wells was a Presbyterian preacher. He was training young men, typical of the day. One of the things they did was they had a revival every year. Now, revivals used to be a big thing. Uh, we haven't had any lately. I remember my first church. We had this old guy there. He, he said he finally remembered the two week brush, brush arbor meetings that were held outside in July. I thought you have forgotten most of what misery was between the mosquitoes, the snakes, and the heat in central Texas in July. I don't think it was that great a time. Memory is a funny thing. But they had one of those revivals. And who they brought in was a preacher whose name was James McCready. McCready was a staunch Calvinist. He spent his whole time preaching about the destiny of the lost and the hope of the saved, and that no one could become the child of God on their own. God had to make them one before they were born, and if you were not it, you were out. In the audience was Martin W. Stone listening to this, and it bothered him. Something that was wrong. Something wasn't working right. He wrote in his journal these words, he left me without one word of encouragement. 
So he decided, I want to see for myself what it says. And he began to read his Bible, looking to see how accurate Calvinism was. He begins his journey. Uh, then he went to seminary. He got ready to be ordained a preacher to get his license in the Presbyterian Church. And the standard phrase his dad had to answer was this. Do you accept the Westminster Confession of Faith as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Bible? That's called Bible Plus, Bible Plus Westminster Confession. He'd been reading the Bible enough where that question disturbed him. To say no meant he was done. To say yes would have meant that he was accepting the confession of the text. So his answer is this. I do, as far as I see it, consistent with the word of God. You know, Stone is pretty diplomatic, frankly. That's a good way to answer that. It's a yes and a no all built into one. And it gave him enough to where they said, okay, you can be a Presbyterian preacher. Um, and then something happened. 1801, in Cambridge, Kentucky, it's only about 25 years since uh, Daniel Boone had found the Cumberland Gap to where you could move west. During that period of time, not many people moved out there. There may have been a thousand people within a 500 mile radius. Not, not very many. But they had a what we call a gospel meeting. They called it the Cambridge meeting. And what was interesting, any preacher could preach from any, any different religious group. Think about what that sounded like. A Methodist would say his piece, a Presbyterian would say his piece, and pardon but the stones on the preachers. The, uh, the Baptist would say their piece, and people were confused. All these different opinions, what do we do with it? And so people begin to say, maybe you want to look at the Bible to see which one is right. Um, and remember, there's probably a thousand people within a 500 mile radius. There were 20,000 people at Cambridge. You got 20,000 people in one place today, you heard a handstand. 20,000 people where there were none. And it was interesting. Now, just to show you, Cambridge is still there. I'll show you a little bit more in a moment. It is just east of Lexington and south of Cincinnati. It's a very populated area today. A lot of, a lot of people there. It wasn't like that in 1801. In fact, if you looked at this, none of those towns were on the map at that time. Throughout the country. And so they held this meeting. Several things happened. They had something called the exercise. Didn't mean that they did calisthenics before the preaching. What that meant was they were so emotionally overcome by hearing the fact that they could respond to the gospel, that they could be saved, that they were they were physically, visibly overcome to the point they would fall down on the ground and they'd beat their head against the ground. They just begin to bark like dogs. How'd you like to be that church, sir? Yeah, it's bad enough kids start crying for us. Let all the people drive down and start beating their heads on the ground. And that's what was that was happening. But it was this emotional outpouring of something that had been pent up for so many years that now there was some sort of hope left in that. And and Barton W. Stone was in the thick of this, and they were preaching free salvation to all who believe. That was radical. Very radical. Nobody ever said that up until now. So things begin to change. Now, just to give you an idea, they were, because there were Presbyterian preachers there preaching salvation for all, they were called before the, the Kentucky Synod to answer for their acts of heresy. They were tried, and if you were convicted, you were defrocked. One of the defrocked with Barton W. Stone. So they figured out, okay, if we're not going to be part of the 
that presbytery will form our own. And they called it Springfield Presbytery. They had, they had this idea that maybe we could stay Presbyterians, but be different than Presbyterians. Remember, all restoration movements start off as reformers, but they can't stay that way. And so Stone and the other men that were with him, they kept examining the scripture. One of the things they wanted to do was to be free of human government. That's, that was their term, meaning bishops and senators. And the more they read in, in the Bible, they kept saying, we don't see anything about presbyteries at all. Now that's a shock if you're a presbyter and or a presbyter, if you're in a presbytery and you can't you know, find what you what you are there. And you want to find what you are there. So what happened was in five months they dissolved it. They t they read themselves out of their of their presbytery. And to make sure that it was gone. They did what you do with anybody who dies. You have a last will and testament. It's called the last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery. And this is what they wrote. We will that this body die, be dissolved and sink in the union with the body of Christ at large. For there is but one body and one spirit, even as we are called in the one hope of our calling. We will that all of our power of making laws for the government of the church will ever cease. That the people may have free course to the Bible adopt the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Basically what that says is, notice the first part, the emphasis on unity. You would always have, the stone would always have an idea that the church is to be unified in some way. Because he was seeing too much division. It also says that there is only one body. And that is not defined by man, that is defined by scripture. And with that, they put the rest in the presbytery. Today, that place where they signed that, Cambridge Meeting House, is still there. Um, it began to deteriorate about 56 years ago. If you had a house that was built in 1800 with mud and logs, I think probably the termites and the weather would begin to get to it. Now, I don't have a fondness for lots of the disciples of Christ except in this one area. They spent boot of money to buy this property. And they built over it a brick building that you can go to today and see the original Cane Ridge Meeting House where they signed the, 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 the last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery. And when Stone died, he was buried in one spot, but they moved his body and what you see, that tombstone on the lower right, that's where he's buried. Had the pandemic not interfered, one of my goals the last two years was to go here. Maybe it'll still happen. But it's still there. Thanks to the disciples who have invested a lot of money in preserving the restoration of Paris. Um, Stone had five pillars to preach. These are things that glitter to preach and constantly. Number one, he, he believed that unity is based upon faith and nothing else. If we believed in Christ together in the same way, we would be unified. Remember, he's big on unity. Big on unity. And it will come out even more. He also believed that the local church was an independent congregation, not to be governed by anybody else. Does that kind of match what we do today? Yeah. That was revolutionary the age of Methodism and Baptist Church and uh, Presbyterians they all have external organization he said that's the only thing we're going to do then he said yeah the church has a right to choose its own preacher now as I said the preacher had to be ordained and licensed that continues to be a problem today are you aware that in the state of Arkansas right now, you have to put up a letter at a courthouse if you're going to do a wedding, proving that you have been ordained a minister? I can't tell you how many letters I've written on behalf of Waterview members making them ministers 
in the state of Arkansas so they can perform their daughter's wedding. Boy, that's worth a lot, don't you know? But it's still a holdover. But he said, the church has a right to choose its own preacher. They, have not, they don't have anybody assigned by the, by the bishop. And he has not the right to either hire or fire. That's the church's right. I saw that in the pages of the New Testament. And that preachers are licensed by God, not man. Can't determine whether a guy can preach or not. That's up to God. Um, and those were the, the, the basic pillars of what he, was, what he preached for all those years. And if you'll notice, every last one of those have seeped into who we are today. All of them. But then the last one is the unequivocal authority of Scripture which undergirds the rest of this. The Bible only, nothing else. He was fanatical about that idea. So much so that he was, that, that last will and testament of Springfield Preston just believed for that idea. And as someone said, it was like dropping a match and dry stubble and create a fire, like a fire dry stubble. And it spread. It spread in a territory where they didn't have any people. Now that's contagious. You have a thousand people. It's amazing what they did with this. But uh, here's the problem. The devil's always in the details. It's one thing to talk about restoration. It's another thing to make it happen. I had a friend of mine in Houston who, for various reasons, were difficult. His church and another congregation had to merge. I'll never forget him telling me, I asked him, said, how's the merger? He said, don't ask. I thought, two congregations of churches of Christ to believe the same thing and act the same way, it's hard to get a merger. He said, you'll never believe what you argue over. Which songbook do you use? See, that's not a problem today. We just throw them all out and use the screens. But then we argue over whose company we buy the books from. Or the slides from. How many men do you put at the Lord's table? One of them say the prayer, or do you have somebody special say in the prayer who doesn't serve? When does it come? Who's going to be the preacher? Who's going to be the elders? What time are they going to start? How many Bible classes are they going to have? Is my favorite teacher going to be able to teach? That's within our, in our brethren. Imagine what happens if you started from scratch and said, what do we need to do to restore the New Testament church? And it got to be difficult because there's a different theory and practice. In theory, it looked pretty plain. I've had people say this to me. One time I almost had to laugh. I suppressed it. The guy said, if somebody wants to be saved, all they got to do is read their Bible. In fact, his whole evangelism program was, let's just give everybody a Bible and tell them to read it. Hmm. Why nobody has a Bible? But see, the difference in theory and practice, that sounds good, that's not how it works. Restoration, it sounds good, we're just going to restore the pattern of the New Testament. What is that pattern? What details are you going to restore? Which ones are you not? Are we all going to meet in an upper room because the New Testament church met in an upper room? What if you're crippled? Do we need to have services that last past midnight so if you fall out the window, Paul can raise you from the dead? Huh. See, that's different in theory and practice. So they asked the same question that James uh, O'Kelly asked. If we're not going to be Presbyterians, what are we? Question, I mean, good question. If we're not going to call ourselves Presbyterians, what are we going to call ourselves? If somebody says, what are you religiously, what are they going to say? Well, we're a group of guys who believe in reading, reading the Bible, and you know, but I mean, what are you? That's what their problem was. And so, one of the guys made his way west was a guy named Rice Haggard. Remember Rice Haggard from last week? If you were here last week. Rice Haggard came from the James O'Kelly movement. 
Bryce Haggard has an interesting background, I think. I don't know anything about him, but I do know this. He is a preacher with one sermon. Now, I know preachers who have one sermon. They just dress it up. It's the same sermon all the time. Here's, the, here's his sermon. What do you call yourself if you're not a Presbyterian or a Methodist or Baptist? We're just Christians. Acts 11 says at Antioch, they were first called Christians. So that's the only thing they can be called. And they go, well, okay, that looks like the only scripture we've got to give us any authorization of what to call ourselves. And so let's call ourselves Christians. That looks, that looks easy, doesn't it? In about 50 years plus from that, it's going to create problems. Because you're going to have a Christian church. And the question we'd have to ask ourselves today, are we the Christian church? What would we say? No, we stared down at the corner of Park and Independence. See how difficult using the word Christian is? But then, if you're not if you're not foreordained to be lost or saved, and you can become a Christian, how do you become a Christian? Looks simple to us. Then to them, they're Presbyterians. Remember, their background was sprinkle babies. Sprinkle babies because that's what you did. You sprinkle babies. We don't know if they're lost or saved. We're going to sprinkle that baby anyhow. Do we still sprinkle babies? So they started looking at Scripture again. They don't find any babies being baptized. So they said, it doesn't look like it. Well, then what do we do? So they started looking in places like Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, and they looked at Acts 8, the Jewish nobleman, and they looked at Acts uh, 9 with Paul, and they looked at Acts 10 with Cornelius, and they looked at Acts 16 and Acts 22, then they looked in places like John 3.23 that says, and John was baptizing at Aden in Salem because there was much water there. They read Romans 6 where it talked about a death, burial, resurrection. You go down and you come out. And when they read all of this stuff, they said, the only thing we can really see in Scripture is that they were immersed in water. And apparently from 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, you're not saved unless you're immersed in water. That sound like us? I hope it does. If not, we need to go back and read two of what we're saying, I think. But that's what they did. And so they started immersing in water for the forgiveness of sin. That's even more radical. Still is today, pretty much. But they ran into a problem. The question is presence or absence? When you read the Bible and nothing is said about something, does that give you permission? Or if you read the Bible and you read about something, does that exclude everything else? It's a thorny problem. When my uh, There was a time before about 1970 or something like that where Texas did not have a law in the books that said you could turn right on red. If you're old enough, you remember that. They changed the law, you could turn right on red. There was a time you couldn't turn right on red. My grandfather was from California. They had a law in the books there that said you can turn right on red unless it says you can't. He came to Texas. My dad's in the passenger seat. He's in the driver's seat. He pulls up to a red light, looks around, red. He makes a turn. My dad says, you can't do that. He says, sure I can. It didn't say you couldn't. There's the crux of restoration right there. If it doesn't say you can, does that give you permission to do it? And if you see one thing, does that mean that's the only thing you can do? We still have that struggle today. And they were struggling with, for instance, in baptism, it never says anything about not baptizing babies. Does that mean you could baptize babies? That got to be a heated debate. But this was a movement that grew. I mean, it grew like you'd never believe it could grow. Um, in 1804, this is in a, an area that doesn't have any people to it. Very sparsely populated. There were 15 Christian churches in two states. Kentucky and the south part of Ohio. Imagine that. That's three, that's three years after King Lee. 
and it's already gone that far. If you go three more years into 1807, there are 24 Christian churches in four states. Keep going. And then when you go a little further, by the time you get to 1832, there are more than 15,000 members in an area that probably has 100,000 folks total. That's an amazing kind of growth. This is what the, the this, this was the way it caught on. For people who were longing to see something that, that they could use in their lives, this was something that they caught on. I can read a Bible for myself, I can see what it says, and I can ask the question. Powerful else. But this is how I'm gonna end tonight. I'm gonna tell you about a guy who knew John who knew Barton W. Stone. His name is John Allen Gano. Gano studied under Barton W. Stone in school. And when Stone died, he succeeded him as the preacher at Cade Ridge. Anybody heard of John Allen Gano? If so, I'll let you tell the story. Anyway, he studies under Barton Stone. He was the preacher there. He had a son who was Confederate general. That's not particularly important, except he had that, that general had three sons, and they set up a law practice in the city of Dallas. I don't know what it was called. Somehow, Gano, Gano, and Gano just doesn't have the ring to it, does it? Doesn't sound Jewish enough. Um, one of those guys drew up a, a charter for a little school they were trying to get together in the plains of West Texas. It was called the Classical Children's Institute in 1906, which became Abilene Christian University. And another one of those sons had a daughter who had a son, and that meant that John Allen Gano, the student of Barton W. Stone, the successor of Great Cambridge, he was the grandfather of a guy named Howard Hughes. You might know Howard Hughes. Some of you may be too young. Howard Hughes developed a Hughes tool company. At one point in time, when I was a kid, he was the richest man in the world. Life he is to be. Almost died in Managua. Every time we go to Managua, we pass this hotel. And the top floor of that hotel is where he lived. He escaped taxes. And he got sick and almost died and they flew him back to the United States. But I know this story because I talked to Jerry Rushman. Jerry Rushman was he was a Bible teacher at Pepperdine uh, University. Many years he was church relations. Jerry's a great guy. He's a real boy. And he got his doctorate degree in church history. And he did his, his dissertation on John Allen Gano. And so as he wrote through this, he did all his research, as you always have to do in graduate school. And he finally came down and he said, you know, this thing traced itself out to the history. And he found out that the mother had been married to a man named and so he decided he would go for that part of genealogy, and the more he did, he kept coming over that she had a son named Howard. And he kept figuring, is this the same one? So he did some more and found out, yeah, it's the same one. So he wrote his dissertation, he sent a copy of it, and he proved Howard Hughes just on the lamb. He could think of how he's going to read some, some yay in Texas. And so, Jerry and his wife got married. And at the reception, this special courier comes with a huge box as a gift. They open it up. There is this engraved silver tea service with a note that says, thanks for the reading, Howard Hughes. How many people can say the richest man on the planet gave them a wedding? But it's interesting how things twist themselves out, and we'll find more of those as we go through. But let me talk a little bit about Stone's legacy. A lot of what we are today, the Church of Christ, we owe to him. And a lot of what he did, we need to remember what he did, because it would serve us well as we go forward. One thing is that it takes real courage to stand up for the faith of Eastern religious culture today. He paid a dear price. 
He lost everything of his past. He was he had, had his living taken away from him. He had to start over. He had to explain to whoever wanted to hear it why he was doing such crazy stuff. It took a lot of courage for him to do it. It still takes that kind of courage today. To try to, to say, this is what we believe regardless of what everybody else believes. That's a great heritage to read. But the second is it takes it takes courage to keep questioning your conclusion. He never did stop questioning what he already learned. He wanted to know if it still matched. There's an interesting problem we, we run into sometimes. We, we look at something through the lens of what we already believe, and we snap it together. We say, well, that says what I already believe. Stone didn't do any of that. He said, I know this is what I believe right now, but when I look at the Bible, does that conform? Do, am I really doing what it says? That takes a lot of courage, because you may have to change. What a dirty thing that is. If you believe to change, you have to change because of what the Bible has to say. That is one of the things he left us that we really need to hold on to. The ability to look afresh and say, this is what we're doing, but is that what the Bible tells us to do? And look at it with fresh eyes. Next week, we're going to sharpen the point of restoration. We're going to meet two men who will forever change who we were and how we think.